we can move on to the next and the final talk in this in this block now, which is by Terry. Terry, are you there? Sorry, I'm here. Um, Terry, are you planning to share your screen? Yes. Okay. Can you see that now? No. no. Not yet. There it's come. There it is. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Um, and this has been a really wonderful meeting uh, so far, and there's been so much information. Um, and uh, I, I we, we we hadn't planned this, and and so we we're sort of quickly filling back in. Um, some covering some aspects um, that are, are, I think might be helpful for our discussions later in the in the breakout sessions. And so once again, I wanted to go back to um, you were introduced um, on the first day to the task force on hemispheric transport, and then yesterday you you were introduced to the the leadership team um, and. Tim, myself, um, Yasek Kaminsky, and Rosa Wu, um, who will be participating in the in the breakout sessions today. Um, and you heard that um, the Hemispheric Task Force is, is organizing a, a, a set of model and comparison studies um, with three streams of activity. Um, and, and this was one really focused on future anthropogenic um, emission scenarios um, that are intended to be very policy relevant for the LERTAP convention. The other is a, um, a set of mercury um, simulations that are really trying to contribute to the Minamata Convention's effectiveness evaluation, trying to look at how the Minamata Convention has led to it, whether or not you can detect changes in um, environmental levels of, of mercury due to actions uh, of the convention. And then finally, a multi-pollutant um, study of fires. And so um, we thought it would be helpful um, to, um, to explain a little bit about uh, a little bit more about what we what we hope to get out of this multi-model, multi-pollutant study of fires. And so one is that we are interested in improving our understanding of fires um, as a source of air pollution. And um, from the task force perspective, our, our stock and trade is, um, it is looking at air pollution from what I have taken to call extra regional air pollution. So we're interested in how sources of air pollution that occur outside of a given region impact a, a particular region of the world. And and looking at those source receptor relationships on large intercontinental scales. And so we want to design a set of model experiments that will help us estimate the impacts of fires at the regional and global scale across multiple pollutants. We want to estimate how those impacts are expected to change over time and what potential there is for mitigation. And we want to identify uncertainties and variability in our understanding so that we can inform efforts to decrease those uncertainties, providing feedback back into the burned activities um, to reduce the uncertainties. But in addition to understanding fires itself, we're also trying to use fire as a, as a place, uh, a topic 
that we can bring together communities that are used to working quite independently from one another to assess the impacts of multiple pollutants. And so we're interested in what can we learn from bringing together um, the, the, the aerosol community, the ozone community, um, the metals, uh, mercury community, and the persistent organic pollutants communities. And which sometimes use uh, different tools and, and different model constructs. Um, and we want us to, to see what we can learn from applying um, uh, these different tools and different approaches to the same problem and um, and see what what, um, what we can transfer to the to being able to do more integrated analysis um, of multiple pollutant problems over time. So um, you've heard a couple of times reference to um, the HTAP Fires white paper and and the we've made the um, the link available to this a couple of times in the chat. Um, but the the way that we're trying to move the conversation forward is by putting this um, this open um, community paper um, that we're trying to draft um, and to have people go in and put down what they're interested in and write a few sentences about that and what what pollutants they're interested in, what impacts they're interested in, um, what other efforts are going on um, that, that, that we might take into account um, to identify the models that they could bring to bear um, and, and the characteristics of that, uh, of those models, um, what observational data they might have to be able to evaluate those, what emissions data, um, et cetera, and then use this um, community effort to design a, a set of experiments to meet um, those um, uh, objectives that we have. And the other thing that I want to point out about this is this paper isn't solely intended for the purpose of HTAP, um, but also to serve as sort of a common reference point that if if there are groups that are doing similar work that are interested in, in specific aspects of this, um, this could be documented in this paper and this paper can live um, beyond um, uh, uh, our own work under the task force, um, but continuing on so that this provides an, an, a place to, to communicate and articulate the differences and and um, synergies between different efforts that that might be going that that are, are going on and may be planned. So we're hoping that this is useful for the community as a whole, not just for, for this particular effort. Okay, so if we're going to do a multi pollutant study of, of fire impacts, then we have to take the emission inventories and emission estimates that you've been talking about. Um, the last couple of days, which primarily focus on um, on the aerosol components um, and the or organic um, components of those. Um, and we have to extend those to these other pollutants that we care about. And so um, I only have this one more slide, um, and this is intended to to capture a lot of discussion that has gone on um, within the uh, previous task force meetings um, to talk about how we might get estimates of, of mercury, of lead, and, and persistent organic pollutants, including PAHs like benzoapyrene. And so basically, um, what we know of is that there are um, really two methods that have been used to calculate some of these. And one is simply to um, take the burned biomass from one of these wildfire emissions data sets and apply uh, an emissions factor um, to that, that biomass burned. Um, and the other is um, to actually take the estimate from these of the emissions of PM 2.5 and then apply a fractional composition um, which has been observed either in the plume or in ash. And so um, the first method um, is the method that we are currently using to move forward 
with our mercury work. So under HTAP, um, the our mercury study for the that's contributing to the Minamata Convention um, has has already produced um, two um, mercury fire emissions inventories. And this work was done by Ilya Ilin, um, Eric Roy, who's been on, um, and I don't know whether Eric's on right now, um, and David McLagan. And, and basically what they did was they took burned biomass from GFED and from FIN, and um, they basically applied mercury emission factors from Andre 2019 by biome um, and to calculate the emissions. And as you've heard um, before, there's issues about the emission factors, about whether those are um, derived from um, lab studies or field studies and whether those field studies are far downwind and looking at age plumes or whether they're looking at um, near source. And so um, McGlagan and and um, and um, collaborators have um, near source aircraft based um, uh, observations. And so what we did in this study was to replace the temperate and boreal um, uh, emission factors with um, factors that were based on these um, relatively recent aircraft studies. Um, that um, we think provide a better estimate. So that's what we're using right now to move forward with the, the mercury runs. And so we have two complete mercury global inventories. Um, a very similar approach has been applied by um, Xu Tao and Jenmin Ma um, at uh, PKU and LZU to produce global inventories for benzoapyrene, um, which they've added to their um, global um, black carbon anthropogenic inventories. And um, so taking a very similar approach of the burned biomass from GFED and applying an em applying emission factors. Um, and then again, the, the second approach, um, we've seen examples of that have been uh, used uh, with lead. Um, and to get uh, global inventories for, for lead um, by using the fractional composition um, from uh, of PM 2.5. So just wanted to share that those are the, that's the work that we know of that's been done to extend um, these. And we're hoping that um, in whatever we do for um, the, the fires work, we can build on that and extend um, those inventories to other chemicals that that uh, pollutants that we might be interested in. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, Terry. That, that helps us uh, to prepare for some of the questions in the breakout sessions that we have later this afternoon or later today, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, there's also time for questions on on this. Is anybody else who's online today aware of other um, groups which are working on um, uh, metals and, and pops and, and other toxics uh, emissions from fires, perhaps? That's, that would be interesting to know. Sina has a hand up. Well, maybe I'll get myself to work today. <laughs> um, Terry, that's so exciting. Um, I worked with Hans like but almost 20 years ago, I think, on mercury emissions from fire. So I'm so excited to see the um the measurements being done again. Um I was curious about the lead and maybe I missed this, but where does the lead come from? Is it just part of the ecosystems and gets resuspended, similar to like mercury, or is that the case? I I'm not the best person to to answer that, but th I think that that's our main concern um, with most of the metals um, is the is the resuspension of previously deposited metals that have built up um, 
in in the vegetation primarily and in the soil. Yeah. And in that case, we might want to think about, um, you know, and this is something I thought about a long time ago, but like, you know, those mercury lead, you know, particularly mercury like near power plants, you might expect the lead concentrations to be higher or the mercury concentrations to be higher than, you know, in downwind of the power plants, power plant plumes and elsewhere. Um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do some cool work there. And I would say, you know, within 2.5, if you have emission factors, they could readily be put into the emissions models to produce whatever you want. Uh, like, you know, if we have measurements, we just want the measurement community to, to take more measurements of these really important um, components. So um, thanks for this. I'm really, it's, it's really great to see it moving forward. So thanks. Eric, you have a hand up. Yes, hi. Um, hopefully uh, sound's coming in. Yes. Um, yes. No, I just wanted to follow up on that. That was an excellent point and something that I think we all strive to do better with and something my current work is looking at, seeing how we can kind of combine existing atmospheric observations with models to try and get a more spatially representative uh, understanding of these emissions. But um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good point, Christine. And I think something that more uh, measurements would be helpful for. Also, just to follow up on that one, I mean, that basically requires a totally different uh, application of emission factors, right? Then, I mean, normally we look at what kind of biome or what stuff is burning and then we apply the emission factor, but here's probably more the location where it's coming from that governs the emission factor, right? Um. Yes and no. Um, I, I think because um, there the accumulation in different uh, certainly the uh, accumulation is going to be different in different places, but it also matters a lot on what surfaces that um, the deposition occurred. So uh, because deposition varies by biome, um, and so. So and and we're talking about we're talking about very long term um, accumulation um, uh, occurring. That's that's something we haven't really dealt with. But um, you know, if you have fires moving through and it mobilizing um, for a, a really long time, you know, the deposition that's that's occurred over a very long time, and then um, uh, how, how often fire is revisited in that area. It, it, you know, the, there you have a different cycle. But I, I think the big concern is the deposition over really long periods of time leading to accumulation as opposed to more nearer term. Okay, thanks, cool. Yeah. I was wondering about the, um, the the type of emission inventory that could be used for these, um, so to add um, uh, the the metals and, and pops to. So the the ones that you've listed here are based on the burnt area um, approach. Would it be possible also to use the the top down emission inventories based on the fire radiative power here as well to to add on mercury and pops to them? To me, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think there would need to be a lot more work to develop the the emission coefficients that are being applied there. And my my understanding is that a lot of those are sort of calibrated back to the burned um, biomass um, emission estimates. And so they're derived to match some of that. And so that that's a an important question that I have back to the people who work with the fire radiative power um, methodologies is what would we have to do um, to be able to understand to, to be able to use that activity um, to calculate emissions of some of these other things. 
I see a couple of comments in the in the chat on the uh, spatial variability of different emissions as well. So Christina mentions that uh, chlorinated compounds might be emitted more along coastlines. Um, and there's a comment from James uh, on the EPA national emission inventory on lead. Um, they vary uh, by state and phase. I'm not sure what phase means in this context. Combustion phase, thank you. Um, and then there's a comment from Eric as well. Yeah. Um, so unlike lead, mercury has a longer atmospheric lifetime, so the thought would be that spatial dependence is less. However, the speciation of mercury, gaseous or particle, could impact the immediate area of the source. In their inventory, they assume that 10% of the emissions are particulate based on limited existing literature. However, more measurements are needed to explore the factors controlling this. Nancy has a comment on different approaches. Um, yeah, different approaches that use energy for emissions will need to be tagged with fuel type and combustion type. So maybe I could add something about you know what we're what we're looking for in terms of uh, fires in in the HTAP study. So so um, as you mentioned, Terry, this 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 HTAP fires has has quite a, lot, a large scope. It's it's um it's yeah there, there's and, and the scope is still being defined by this white paper, but it's also linking in very much with the um, the opens work, the more policy related work, which includes. Um, the analysis of the anthropogenic emissions as well, which is the, the fire emissions. Um, and so we're looking more immediately for a, a fire emission inventory to use in that um, policy relevant study. Um, but ideally, we, we want to keep the two, the two different um, studies, the, the open study and the fire study, as closely linked with each other as possible. And so I think what we're looking for immediately is, is a recommendation for a particular product or some kind of mosaic of products that um, that we can use um, sort of immediately. And by immediately, I mean starting to do model runs um, in the late spring, early summer of next year um, to be delivered within a year or so for us to be able to, um, yeah, thanks for going back there, Terry, to, um, to advise the convention uh, for the upcoming revision of the Gothenburg Protocol. So that's that's the immediate um, need that that HTAP has there is is a recommendation on which uh, product we should be using for fire emissions, but then that will also serve as the baseline um, fire emissions for the for the rest of the fires work going forwards, where we might have more time to think about um, different kinds of sensitivity studies or different kinds of um, ways of combining different emissions products. Does that sound fair, Terry? Yeah, well stated. So, does anybody have any more questions on on um, more broadly, perhaps on on the HTAP fire study, where this is going, what the scope is? comments on what emission symmetry we should be using. I know this is one of the questions in the breakout rooms, but we have a chance here in plenary since there's more time. So Cindy asks Guido um, when GFED 5 will be out. Um, <laughs> that's um, I'm always saying in two months, but I will hope end of this year, early next year. Uh, the, I mean, the burned area is out. Um, the paper was accepted, so that's now in press. Uh, the fuel consumption paper is out. The emission factors, something we want to touch base with Kelly shortly. Um, we have some issues with some of the burned area in forested regions, which, which seems to be so too large. So there's still some 
allocation. So all the ingredients are there. It's a matter of um, yeah, finding a bit more time, but, but hopefully by December or maybe January. And there will be data from initially 2002 through 2020, and then we'll work on updating it towards a new real time. So there are also some comments in the chat there on the importance of including open waste burning, especially in Africa. But just getting back to that um, that that uh, point on on GFED, it's, it seemed to me, looking at some of the comparisons that we've seen, that that maybe GFED seemed to be kind of in the middle of a lot of the other inventories. Maybe not in all regions or for all species, but um, but that seemed to be a, a more of a middle of the road kind of inventory compared to some of the others. Is that is that a fair overall assessment? Uh, from my perspective, that may be the case, but that's also, I think, because a lot of comparisons we've seen so far use the older thin versions. I think if you use 2.5, GFET is probably one of the lower ones, and then GFET 5 will be, yeah, hopefully in the middle again. Uh, So perhaps that's also a, um, a, a, a small argument for considering GFED 5 as, as a potential inventory for this work, since it's, it's not exactly the average, but in the middle of, of the other inventories. Something to think about. I think um, probably we're we're running out of um, time, but I'm I'm very interested in the conversation going on in the chat about um, open waste burning, which I realize isn't necessarily the the focus of this, which is focused on biomass burning, but um, the idea of being able to see open waste burning in, in some of the satellite products and being able to include that, um, and. I'm we wondering five, five minutes yeah. in this session. So if, if this was something to move on to, then sure. Hey. Hand up and down and back back up again now. Okay, great. Yeah. Um no, I'm I'm still intrigued by this quest uh, the discussion above um how important uh, the different combustion phase is and that of course relates to the peat burning which which has uh, all of the smoldering and i'm i'm wondering if this is important uh, whether it uh, there may be some information in frp when you look at uh, the maximum value that the satellites see and when you look at the diurnal cycle, the amplitude of the diurnal cycle that you see in the satellites that could give you some information about how much flaming and how much smoldering there is. So over the peat fires, we see a very flat diurnal cycle. So that's very clear. Um, so if if for, for these uh, metals and uh, PABs, that, that's important. Uh, we could think about uh, having additional data in there. They We archive them. They're not in the official GFAS products, but they are being archived. There's, there's more information there which we might use if that's, if, if that's really an important uh, process. Can you repeat that, Johannes? Uh, what is being archived? Uh, we are archiving uh, the magnitude of the diurnal cycle. Ah, okay. I mean, from the hourly product, you can see it right away, but we are also archiving it separately. And we are also keeping track of the number of uh, modus detections we had have in each grid cell and the uh, magnitude of the largest FRP in each grid cell. So that also gives an indication whether you've got one very hot, strong fire flaming or many small fires, uh, maybe cooler fires. So I see some but, more comments. In, sorry, yeah. go on. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if you if you'd like to continue on that point, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. It's it's really my question is how important is this combustion phase for for the metals and the perhaps.
thanks for that. Um, so there are a couple of comments here um, in the chat um, that maybe GFED is underestimating compared to the measurements. So that's also a consideration of um, maybe choosing an inventory that uh, having the comparison to measurements in mind when we choose an inventory and um, uh, that perhaps it might also be useful to consider at least one top-down emission inventory in the comparison because GFED 5 is bottom up. And this maybe leads to the, the idea that maybe in the HTAP fires work, if there was enough interest from the modeling community, that potentially we could think about using multiple inventories and then we could turn this uh, part of this into a multi-model, multi-inventory, multi-effects, multi-pollutant um, study as well, um, if people have the appetite to do more model runs on that. So there's more, more comments um, on that, which you can all see in the chat. But I think we are now at the end of this uh, this this session. We have a minute to go, but that doesn't leave us any time to start any new questions. Um, so thanks again to all of the speakers um, uh, and to all of all of the comments and all of the questions. That was great. Um, so Nancy, you're there. Would you like to take over? No, uh, fine. I think it's time for our break. So um, we're going to be breaking now and reconvening at the top of the hour. Um, and at that point, we will give you instructions for breakout. Please come back and 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 be. Um, a vital part of our workshop is having people do the breakout. So please uh, come back for that at the top of the hour. Thanks. <laughs>